people are a little overly optimistic about how likely it is that we can solve the inflation problem quickly and in a way where we don't have to include more policy and more rising rates. I'm desperately waiting for the chance to buy Europe. It's not there. I'm paying very, very close attention to the big national banks in Europe. And if those start turning around, whether it's the Deutsche, the Sockgen, the UBS of the world, I think that could be a real key for growth and a big opportunity because those stocks have been beaten down so badly. It was taken as almost axiomatic um, six months or a year ago that at some point the Chinese economy would surpass the American economy in terms of total GDP at market exchange rates. That's now much less clear. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacqua. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. A summit like no other. Indonesian President Jokowi tells Bloomberg that Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin will attend the G20 summit in Bali, setting up a showdown with Joe Biden. Divergent signals. Would Fed officials debate whether next month's rate hike should be 50 or 75 basis points? The mixed messaging leaves Wall Street struggling to build on yesterday's gains. Plus, pounding on cable, sterling is set for its worst week since April, beset by double-digit inflation, labor unrest, and slumping consumer confidence. Now, first thing is first, so let's check on the markets. Just a picture across the board, a bit of pressure, not only on some of these European stocks, but also some of the gilts. Now, the UK economy, um, we're seeing day after day some pretty dire economic data, certainly when it comes to inflation. Retail sales for last month, a little bit of a bright spot as mo more people stayed here at home, also bought barbecues, and that was really driven by some of the online sales. Now, the picture will change or could change to next week with the catalyst of Jackson Hole. We'll hear from Jackson from Jay Powell at Jackson Hole. The U.S. 10-year yield at 2.9390. Um, this is a good one to look at, but I also want to look at cable. Euro dollar 10088. If you look at cable, the concern as, of course, we're seeing an ever weaker sterling. What that means, of course, for debt, as Mark Carney were saying, after all, the UK, because of the composition of the economy, is very reliant on the kindness of strangers. Let's get on to the European map. The story, not only one of taxation, which we look at Germany and Greece to see the difference. We just spoke also to the chief economic advisor uh, to the prime minister of Greece. The UK, you can see, pretty much unchanged. And then the CAC actually down two-tenths of a percent. So some of the other stocks we're watching, Bed Bath & Beyond, plunging 43% after Ryan Cohen has sold its stake. This is pre-market uh, Bed Bath & Beyond, so we'll look at how it opens in the U.S., down over 40%. Now, let's kick it off with the Fed, and we've been speaking with some top voices on the direction of policy over the next few months. They confirmed what I suspected, which was that the Fed doesn't know where it is, that the world is very ambiguous at this point, and minutes of a meeting are a very poor way to convey a collective uh, message. But I think they're going to continue to raise rates. I don't think they're going to take any pa pause anytime soon. If they get lucky, they can get it right. But it's very difficult uh, uh, to, to know exactly where you are, uh, because as I said, the data always come in with, with a lag and there can be a lot of shocks that, that come in. So I'm sure they're not going to get it exactly right. That's what they're trying to do. Um, I think if they're going to make a mistake, it's going to be on uh, tightening a little bit too much because they really want to make sure that they bring inflation down. I don't think we're in a recession right now, but as we continue to raise rates, as we continue to raise costs, so to speak, of borrowing across the economy, it should be putting, tapping the brakes on the U.S. economy, and that makes it more likely that we would end up in a recession. Now we're joined by Richard Saldana, Portfolio Manager for Global Equity and Income at Aviva Investors. Richard, thank you so much for joining us. When you look at the global market, what exactly needs to change right now? What's the next catalyst for markets? Not getting any audio. All right, Richard, I think we do have. I, I'm no like Inspector Colombo, but I think we'll have to come back to you if you can't hear me. And we'll get back to, of course, the markets and some of Richard's calls, not only on fixed income, but what it means for equity investors. Let's do a market check and see in the meantime if we can actually, um, you know, fix the audio with Richard Saldana. Uh, some of the things we're looking out for is President Xi and President Putin, of course, attending the G20 summit in Indonesia. That was according to the Indonesian President Joko Widodo uh, speaking 
speaking to our editor-in-chief. Some of the other things that we're looking at, of course, is dollar moving higher against some of the Asian Pacific currencies after the publication also of the report as geopolitical tensions boosted demand for the U.S. currency as a haven. So we'll look at that. We'll look at uh, some of the other stories that we've been watching out for. I know we have our Tim Craighead. He has wonderful charts looking at some of the summer reading that we could be doing. In terms of what the market is looking at, look, a lot of folks will be on the global rate hike wagers. Two voting members, for example, on the uh, Fed Committee, St. Louis, James Bullard, and Kansas City's Esther George emphasized both that the U.S. Central Bank will continue to raise interest rates until inflation eased back to its 2% par target. Okay, let's try and get back to Richard Saldana. Richard, can you hear me? I can indeed, Francine. Wonderful. Half the job done because you can hear me, I can hear you. Um, Richard, talk to me a little bit about where you see value or your biggest conviction in these kind of markets. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I, I think on the back of the earnings season, I think it's been really informative for us in terms of, you know, where the value lies right now. So, look, we continue to see the tech space is very attractive. You know, we've had a strong rebound, you know, since mid-June. But, look, when you look at the results out of names such as Microsoft and Alphabet, I mean, we think they really highlighted the resilience of these companies. So, you know, areas such as cloud computing, internet search, you know, remain strong. I mean, Alphabet was a case in point. I think there's been a lot of market fears around, you know, areas such as advertising growth. And we've seen it in other areas as well in the tech space, e-commerce notably, where you've seen exceptional growth. You know, you think in 2021, you know, you know, as, you know, from the pandemic. But growth has understandably slowed this year. But I think the key for us is you're still seeing, seeing reasonable level, levels of growth this year. And it really highlights, yeah. I think, these companies are, are more resilient than perhaps people thought. But uh, Richard, do you worry, so earnings season fairly robust, do you worry that it's going to get much worse as we go into the winter? Yes, yeah, so absolutely. I think it's been quite robust. I think what's been interesting for us, you know, top line has certainly proved stronger than bottom line. So you're still seeing a lot of companies being squeezed from a margin perspective. So whether it be cost inflation pressures, supply chain bottlenecks, I mean, it was quite interesting for us that, you know, top, top line growth for the S&P, if you strip out energy, was 9% year over year. But the earnings growth actually year over year was negative if you strip out the energy company. So that really does reflect the margin squeeze. Now, having said that, we have seen some positive commentary, particularly regarding some of the supply chain issues easing. So notably around semiconductors, and we know semi shortages have affected a wide range of industries. So we think that's a welcome development. We think at the margin, that's a positive. Certainly as we go into Q3 and Q4, we'll be keeping a really close eye on that supply chain area. But I think the key for us is look, underlying demand, a lot of industries still remain strong. You're seeing that in terms of order books. You're seeing that in terms of end markets. It's really that supply side of the equation that we need to see you know, you know, start to play out a bit more favorably. And we think that can happen as we go into the sort of next few quarters of the year. So I think there's reasons to be optimistic, right. as I said, but we're certainly not out of the woods yet when it comes to those inflationary pressures. But, so, Richard, I was going to ask, what does that mean for margins? If you look at the inflationary pressures, do you forego margins for market share? I, I don't think so, personally. I think there's lots of examples of companies where pricing power still remains strong right now. So you think about the consumer staples companies that are reported that, you know, you're seeing they're able to push through pricing and actually the elasticity of the end consumer has remained quite strong. So what that's telling you is actually that the demand is still able to absorb that pricing. We're seeing that in other areas. So again, you know, we've been looking at industries such as Elevator, manufacturers like, like Svotis and Kone. Again, you're seeing margins, particularly in terms of their service business has, has remained quite strong. So for us, I mean, the key is I think you're still seeing industries where pricing power remains quite strong and underlying demand at the same time is still robust as well. So I think that's the key for us. It's finding those companies that can still maintain those margins, yeah. you know, clearly as the squeeze continues. Okay. Richard, how much are you expecting some of the supply chain issues, semiconductors, but also others to ease? Or are we going to be a stop and start, not only because of China, but also some of the, you know, the regulatory pressures around the world? Yeah, so I think you're right. I, I do expect this to be quite stop start. I think, as we said, you know, at, at the margin, certainly the, the semiconductors has been, you look at the comments we had from the likes of Volkswagen, you know, highlighting, and we you know the auto industry is a classic case where demand for, you know, electric vehicles has been really strong. You look at the order books there, but obviously ability to deliver to the end customer has been challenged by those semi shortages. So you're starting to see some signs of that easing. That's a good thing. To your point around China, I mean, that still remains a big issue, right? When you think about the globalized nature of supply chains, a lot of it ties into China. And, you know, whilst we have seen, you know, some signs of factories reopening again, 
you're starting to see that starting to come back. But again, I do think it will be stop start, as you said. All right, Richard, thanks so much. Richard Saldana there, a portfolio manager for Global Equity Income at Aviva Investors. Now, coming up, David Harrow from Harris Associates. He joins us. Don't miss that exclusive conversation, 9.30 a.m. London time. We'll talk banks, we'll talk, we'll talk commodities, we'll talk the U.S. This is Bloomberg. Finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francie Lacqua here in London. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. <laughs> Indonesian President Joko Widodo has told Bloomberg that Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin are both planning to attend the G20 summit in Bali. Their presence at the November meeting would set up a showdown with Western leaders who are set to meet in person for the first time since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky is also expected to be in Bali. European intelligence officials are said to believe Russia is using the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in southern Ukraine to shield its troops and equipment, undermining the safety of the plant's operations. Bloomberg understands that the officials think Moscow is using the power station to provide cover for its forces. Russia captured the plant, Europe's largest nuclear facility, back in March. UK consumer confidence has fallen to a record low this month as concerns about a recession increase and soaring inflation squeezes household finances. GFK said its gauge of confidence declined 3 points to minus 44, the lowest level since records started in 1974. The survey comes as the annual rate of inflation in the UK exceeded 10% last month. In the US, a federal judge says sections of the affidavit justifying the search warrant for former President Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago home should be unsealed. The Justice Department has one week to propose what information in the document should be kept secret. The government has opposed the release of the FBI affidavit to protect the integrity of the investigation. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg. Leanne, thanks so much. Now, after beating expectations this quarter, the outlook for European corporate earnings could be rocky, but inflation won't be bad news for everyone. Joining us now to discuss all of this is Bloomberg's Laura Wright. So, Laura, what's behind the European margin outperformance this quarter? Well, Francine, analysts got it wrong. They were too cautious too soon. In fact, operating margins in Europe remain at record levels, as you can see from my chart. This is because companies successfully implemented cost mitigation measures during the pandemic. They restructured in order to survive. And in light of recent cost pressures, well, they've been able to pass on higher prices to customers who so far have been willing to dig deeper into their pockets. Energy, unsurprisingly, was the outperformer. Oil majors brought home record profits this quarter. Sanctions against Russia following its invasion of Ukraine led to a spike in oil and gas prices. Consumer staples resilient. Think of companies like Heineken, Unilever, Danone. They have also been able to successfully increase prices. Discretionary was weaker year over year. It's interesting primarily because car makers are still suffering from component shortages therefore have been unable to fulfill demand orders but no signs of demand destruction yet in that sector. Materials, think metals, mining, chemicals companies, they have been unable to fully offset their higher costs and the industry is cooling from a spike in price action over the last two years. Mm. Utilities were crushed with margins down to 5.5% from nearly 14% a year ago due to the spike in wholesale gas prices, again because of the war in Ukraine with no respite in sight there. So Laura, walk us through the outlook for profitability in Europe. Well, the outlook is deteriorating, and my chart shows operating margin expectations in 2022 compared to 2023 on the stock 600. Consensus as calculated by Bloomberg Intelligence, and you can see that a divergence is starting to emerge. And really, the concern here is what will true demand destruction look like in a weakening economy where disposable incomes are diminished, consumer-facing companies will be under pressure. So... Who will be the winners in this environment of sticky inflation, higher costs, higher interest rates? 
Well, according to the Bloomberg Intelligence quarterly scorecard, it is the oil majors, it is chemicals, mining companies that trade on trough multiples with peak earnings. Laura, thanks so much. Laura, right there with a look at some of the margin expectations in Europe. Now, we're back with Richard Saldana, Portfolio Manager for Global Equity Income at Aviva Investors. Richard, we're talking a little bit about before whether uh, some of the companies had to forego margins to make sure that they hung out to, or, you know, hung on to market share. Overall, what's the state of the U.S. consumer? Look, I'd say overall pretty strong i suggest i think what you're seeing right now and consumers are really fascinating space because there's quite a lot of debate right now you're seeing a real shift in consumer spending patterns as a result of these inflationary pressures right so you know you look at the results out of walmart target this week highlighted you're seeing that mixed shift towards groceries essentials some of the more staples in the basket and away from more discretionary you know merchandise so you're starting to see that from the consumer and back to the point that chart you know really highlights that you've seen the staples companies whether it be the likes of procter and gamble pepsi coca-cola in the us nestle unilever you know here in europe have been able to maintain that pricing because the end demand is still there and the ability of the you know, yeah. end customer to absorb that is still there so you're seeing that shift and i think what's going to be interesting for us as we think about q3 and q4 is are these companies able to keep you know to really make that pricing stick because ultimately at some yeah. point as you said the ability for the consumer to keep absorbing these price increases if infl if the rest of the bar you know the rest of their costs remain elevated will be challenged yeah. but richard is there a difference again if you look at the u.s consumer and the uk consumer do you tend to go for equities that are based in europe or they've outperformed really some of the u.s equities for the last decade is it going to continue to be the same yeah, look, I, I think our preference would still be for the U.S. I think you're, you're certainly seeing a lot of it really ties down to what you're seeing in terms of energy costs, right? So particularly Europe, when you think about the U.K. in particular, right, you know, consumers are facing, you know, really, really high energy costs. And that's really impacting, you know, to a large extent, you know, their ability to, you know, to spend. Whereas in the U.S., that, I'd say that's, you know, that's not as much as big of an issue. So you've certainly seen the U.S. consumer from that perspective. I'd say has held up better. Now that doesn't mean you've got companies in Europe, and again, I've referenced some of those, you know, multinational names, the Nestle's of the world, etc., that are still able to benefit yeah. from that. And the key for those companies as well is the underlying categories are still growing. So whether it be categories such as pet care, coffee, etc., where you're still seeing demand remains quite strong. So, you know, there still are companies in Europe for us that are quite interesting in terms of that pricing and in terms of that end demand environments as well. Richard, thank you so much, as always, for joining us. Richard Saldana, their Portfolio Manager for Global Equity Income at Aviva Investors. Now, coming up, whoever enters number 10 next month will have a double-digit inflation number hanging over their head. We'll take a look at the health check of the UK economy next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now let's stay with the UK. We saw a surprise gain in retail sales for the month of July this morning. The month-on-month -month data saw a small rise, 0.3%, with the expectation being for a drop. Now with inflation at a 40-year high and consumer confidence at the lowest since the 1970s, does this change the narrative for the Bank of England? Well, joining us now is Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden. So, Lizzie, I mean, this was a month-on-month, -month, and I guess it's also because of the nice weather. So does it really the material will change the picture for the UK economy? No. Uh, we had seen 50 basis points in September at the Bank of England's next meeting. That's Bloomberg Economics call. It doesn't really move the dial. Uh, but if you look beyond the upside surprise, this 0.3%, and look beyond sales to volumes, you can see the inflation story playing out. People are spending more money and buying less. Uh, and it's because things cost more. We're, a we're in double-digit inflation. What's more indicative of the state of the economy, perhaps, is the GFK consumer confidence survey that came out overnight. Consumer confidence at a record low because of inflation. Uh, and we're not even at the peak yet. We're set to get uh, more than 13% inflation when energy bills rise in the autumn, says the Bank of England. And that was even before we hit 10%. I mean, so what does this all mean for the Bank of England and in terms of interest rate hikes? I mean, there was a great story yesterday saying that where we could end up, I think, in eight months is actually higher interest rates than in the US. 
indeed, but that's for the next three years. Beyond that three years, it flips back because of the recession risk in the UK. And the Bank of England admits that its own jumbo hikes would be contributing to that recession risk. That's what's so bleak here. That's why markets are uh, getting so gloomy about the UK picture. You've had an interview with Willem Boiter, former BOE rate setter, saying that interest rates could get to as high as 6%. Andrew Sentence, another former MPC member, saying 3 to 4%. Yep. Uh, so it, it looks like we've got a long way to go. Yeah, we certainly do. Lizzie, thank you so much. Lizzie Burden there with a look at the UK economy. Now, the focus is not only on the UK economy, but uh, some of the things that we're seeing when the new prime minister, uh, of course, uh, becomes in charge, what it means for the Northern Ireland Protocol and the relationship with Europe. Coming up, David Harrow from Harris Associates joins us next. We'll be focusing on banks. We'll be focusing, of course, on commodities and world growth. That's coming up shortly. Don't miss that conversation. This is Bloomberg. Like no other, Indonesian President Jokowi tells Bloomberg that Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin will attend the G20 summit in Bali, setting up a showdown with Joe Biden. Divergent signals. Fed officials debate whether next month's rate hike should be 50 or 75 basis points. The mixed messaging leaves Wall Street struggling to build on yesterday's gains. Plus, pounding on cable, Sterling is set for its worst week since April, beset by double-digit inflation, labor unrest and slumping consumer confidence. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition and Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, as Indonesia prepares for the G20 summit in Bali this November, President Joko Widodo has confirmed to us that both Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin are planning to attend. Now, that's despite calls to cancel Russia's invitation over the war in Ukraine. Now, Jokowi, as he's known, spoke to our editor-in-chief, Don Micklethwaite, in West Java. Rivalitas antara negara-negara besar memang... The rivalry of the big countries is indeed worrying. What we want is for this region to be stable, peaceful, so that we can build economic growth. And I think not only Indonesia, Asian countries also want the same thing. But this, did, this visit did not help stability. What we really want is stability. What we want is peace in the region. There is a concern that if there is a conflict in Taiwan, it would spill over into the South China Sea, where you have territory, territory that China contests, and there are territorial um, claims there. Is, the, is Indonesia ready to defend itself or defend its land and waters in that case? Are you ready for that conflict militarily if it happens? We do want the region to be peaceful. It shouldn't come to the point that tensions rise until it affects economic growth and then later on affects the well-being of our people. In my opinion, it is very important that there is a space for dialogue between leaders, especially leaders of big countries. The global situation is extremely difficult, and there shouldn't be further unnecessary issues. We are going through a food crisis and an energy crisis that hasn't been resolved. The pandemic still exists in some countries. I know that you have invited President Xi Jinping to come to the G20. Has he, has he said he will come here in November? Yeah. Xi Jinping yeah. will come. And President Putin? President Putin has also told me he will come. American investment in Indonesia over the past five years is $9 billion. China has invested $40 billion. You know, you look around here, we have a Chinese car factory around the corner. China's, China is buying up a lot of the refineries that make precious metals. Part of the population is Chinese. America at the moment is losing the battle for hearts and minds in Indonesia, but also in Southeast Asia. Do you, do you think that is fair? 
Indonesia wants to be friends with everyone, with any country. We don't have problems with any country. Each country will have their own approach. Each leader has their own style and approach to bring in investment, so there shouldn't be a problem. But now, what's needed by Indonesia is investment, technology. That will change our society. Well, that was the Indonesian President Joko Widodo speaking to our very own editor-in-chief, John Mikothwaite. Now, let's shift the focus to banks, and European banks had one of their best quarters of the last decade, as rising interest rates and market volatility bolstered lending and trading, but without yet driving up bad loans. Now, one of Europe's lenders has had a rough time, though. Credit Suisse has had to shuffle through four chief executives and deal with a host of scandals. I mean, I think we're, the four are basically chief executives and chairmen, so we're putting them all in the C-suite. So let's discuss the year in Europe in banking so far and the outlook for the year ahead with David Harrow. He's chief investment officer for international equities at Harrow's Associates, one of the biggest shareholders at Credit Suisse, sticking with the banks uh, through thick and thin. And I have to say, one of my favorite people to interview on TV, because you always make me smarter oh. on what's going on. What the hell's going on in the banking world? Thank you. Well, first of all, it's very good news for the European banking world. Very good news, because after more than 10 years of fighting the headwinds of negative interest rates and slow growth and rising capital requirements, all these things are becoming tailwinds. Yeah. They're at the capital they need, they're generating right. excess capital. The interest rates are going up, and so finally, the things that have been preventing them oh. from gr using capital to grow and to return to owners, um, it's, it's now happening, so this is very But great. David, it's rough. <clears throat> here, in, I mean, here in Europe, we have rising energy costs, you have the cost of living crisis. Are, are people going to not be able to pay their bills? Uh, it, you know, what does it mean for mortgages? What does it mean for investment banks? Yeah. I mean, we certainly do have this situation with inflation hitting, especially people in the lower economic uh, rungs. But on right. the other hand, don't forget that labor markets are quite strong around the world, even in Europe, stronger than they've been in. Yeah. So on the one hand, you have ri rising prices, pressuring people, but on the other hand, you have a shortage of labor, uh, causing people who want to work, who want jobs to have them. So you got to balance this. Uh, David, what would it take <clears throat> for you to, to sell off, actually, Credit Suisse share? Because you, you've stuck with them, no matter almost what happens. Well, this, was, this has been a problem, child. We've owned this bank, literally, since the early 2001. And the first 10 years was a very good holding. <clears throat> I mean, it literally went from 20 to 60 or yep. 70. Now, what we should have done is just sold it and yep. <laughs> that's it. But of course, during the financial crisis, they actually performed better than most other banks. And we increased our position again and had a very, very poor decade holding Credit Suisse yep. as they've kind of hobbled from one <clears throat> crisis to the next. So what's the situation today? The last 10 years certainly have been bad very bad for the bank, but you look at the situation today, it trades at less than a third of book value. Yeah. It still has a robust private wealth business. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have four businesses, one of which is absorbing the profits of all the other three. And all they have to do really, it, it sounds simple, but all they have to do is prevent the investment bank from losing money right. and get it back to some sort of growth. What would you do with it? Would you spin it off? <clears throat> if they cannot fix it, if they cannot, if they cannot find a way for the investment bank to earn through cycle returns, they have to do something with it. Whether it's spin it, sell it, merge it. But at this stage, the price of Credit Suisse stock assumes roughly a 10 to 15 billion negative on the investment bank. And if they could repair the investment bank, make it such that it can earn through cycle profits, clearly it's worth more than negative 15 billion. David, how much time mm -hmm. should, they th should they try and fix it before they sell it or spin it off or do something with it? Well, certainly in the next year or two, this, this has to be decided, but you can't keep doing the same thing as they've been doing over the last decade and get zero results. They have to put an end to it. At some point, they either have to fix it or to look for other options. Other options? I mean, do, do we need to think about a, a, a big merger? I know regulators are, are you know, not behind it, <clears throat> but is this a, a way of putting it out of its misery? I mean, all of the above. I think the, the most obvious thing for shareholders would be to try to fix it, to prevent them from losing money, 
to get that part of the business to earn money again. They have some very good franchises in there, and there's no reason why they shouldn't be able to ring fence the good franchises, exit the places where they cannot make through cycle returns, and continue. So the best thing for the shareholders would be for them to fix it. But if they cannot fix it, you can't just keep doing the same thing and expect a different result, as the saying goes. Are, are there any banks that you've scooped up because of the changing in, in European banking landscape? We continue to own what I think are three of the best banks in Europe. Lloyd's here in the United yep. Kingdom, and Tessa Sao Paulo in Italy, and BNP in France. To us, these are the quality of the European banking sector. They represent different parts of Europe. They all sell at extremely attractive valuations. They're growing their earnings. They have excess yeah. capital. They're using that capital to grow their businesses as well to reward shareholders. These banks all yield high single digit yeah. uh, dividend yields and they're, and they're growing dividends. So to us, this is one of the great areas of value around the world today are in high quality European financials and these banks specifically. Do you think they're I immune to a possible recession? Now, no bank is immune, but keep in mind, when a recession comes, yes, there will be some pressure on credit yeah. quality, of course. But in this cycle, we're starting at a position of 13 and 14 percent capital mm -hmm. and not 5, 6, 7 percent capital, which is where we were in the last cycle. So we're vastly more prepared for the credit cycle and any adverse credit events today than we were 11 or 12 years ago. Do, do you believe that the good days of value trade are over? I don't think they've started. I'm waiting really? for the good days. <laughs> I'm waiting for the good days. We've certainly seen shock to what I would call growth business price valuations, especially those growth businesses that we, we can be define them as having high yeah. price to sales, very little free cash flow streams. These things have finally, finally gotten hit quite hard. And there's been a little bit of bounce in value, but let's look at European industrials, for mm -hmm. instance. Let's look at a company like Mercedes in Germany, the premier luxury auto brand mm -hmm. around the world, sitting on over 20 billion of net cash. Their biggest problem is they cannot satisfy demand. They're earning double-digit operating margins. It trades at four times earnings and yields at seven or eight percent. But, they, but they, the European stocks have an underperforming the U.S. for what the last decade. They sure Given have. all the concern now with energy prices, proximity to Russia, war in Ukraine, are they going to continue to outperform? These, this is one of, yeah, this is one of the reasons why we have this underperformance. There is this belief that any company based in Europe can't earn money. Right. And what we're seeing, six months plus into the Russian, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, what we're seeing is they've been earning money just fine. Why? Because, yes, they are based in Europe, but they do business all over the world. And this is the disconnect with, I think, the investment community. Believe me, I have clients and shareholders who say, oh, you're invested in Europe. Well, these companies are based in Europe, but they do yeah. business all over the world. And as a result, despite some of the right. headwinds, they've been able to earn good profits. So what's been your best return? Is there a company that actually you wouldn't have thought has done as well as it has so well, far? Well, actually, one, one of our best holdings has been Glencore, oh. but that's for almost counter-cyclical yeah. reasons. People, you know, there's certain things in which they mine, mm -hmm. whether it be copper or nickel, cobalt for green energy, or coal to supplement those countries which now need coal because green energy doesn't always work. Um, so they've been doing very, very well. Yeah. And plus their trading operation has been doing very, very well. This is all planned because we'll talk about Glencore next. Uh, David Harrow there, Chief Investment Officer at International Equities at Harris Associates, stays with us. Coming up next, we'll talk commodities. They've been, of course, a driver of inflation this year. Producers and traders of them have seen record profits, including Glencore. So we'll focus on that next. And this is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now let's get straight to your Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. China Tourism Group Duty Free has raised about $2 billion in its Hong Kong offering. The shares start trading on the 25th of August, injecting activity into the city's sluggish IPO market. It is the biggest listing in the Asian financial hub so far this year. Bloomberg has learned that Qualcomm is taking another run at the market for server processors. Sources say the U.S. company is seeking customers from a product from last year's purchase of the chip startup Nuvia. We are told Amazon's AWS has agreed to take a look at Qualcomm's offerings. The chip giant abandoned an earlier push into the market some four years ago. The Insider website reports Amazon is to stop offering COVID leave for operations employees and return it to standard policy sick leave. The retail giant will also end contract tracing and on-site web notifications about positive cases in most of its warehouses. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash, Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Now, Glencore, the world's top coal shipper, has been one of the biggest winners from the global energy crunch as demand surges for fossil fuels. The company's sprawling trading business has also cashed in on dramatic price swings across markets from metals to oil following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Well, we're back with David Harrow, Chief Investment Officer for International Equities at Harris Associates with one of the biggest holdings, actually, in Glencore. Have you added to that? No, it's, our, it's in our top 10 or 15 holdings. Yeah. And, of course, as prices change, we adjust the holding level. What did people misunderstand about Glencore? I mean, I know no one foresaw, of course, this war in Ukraine and, and the turn back to coal. I don't know whether that changes as we become greener or whether, you know, they will also benefit from the green transition just because the politicians didn't plan for it. Well, see, this is, this is the beauty of Glencore. They, in essence, have, we'll call it, three businesses. One is the trading operation, which behaves as a nice annuity that grows. Number two is what we'll call their things they mine for green energy, for renewables. No. Uh, copper, nickel, zinc, cobalt, all these things that are extremely necessary for renewable energy. And then, of course, until renewable energy becomes persistent and reliable, they mine coal. All of these things have decent cost curves, meaning if price goes up, you're not going to see a flood of supply. Right. There's not a ton of, of easy to get copper laying around, unlike, say, iron ore, which you know, you the marginal mine. cost of iron ore is zero. I mean, you could just keep buying, get, uh, extracting more and more iron ore. But, David, what does it mean? I mean, you know, a coal shipper was toxic, right, as, as we mm -hmm. talked about the transition. Now, because we're so dependent on coal to make up for energy, lost energy elsewhere, does that, what does that mean for the transition? Well, the transition is just going to, it takes time. We do not have the technology today to completely uh, power our grids mm -hmm. by renewable energy. We just don't have it because we don't have the storage capabilities. We don't have, uh, you know, all everything in place to be able to satisfy electric grids around the world. So uh, there will be a transition, and it, it requires an all of the above energy policy. You need this. <clears throat> in essence, this is the S and ESG. People right. have to be able right. to heat their homes and power their elect uh, electrical grids, and you know be able to have access to affordable energy. At the same time, so we're seeing that some of the shareholders, um, a, a big, well, not majority, but a, a big chunk of shareholders of Lencore are now questioning their climate plan. What Does it mean that the company will be under pressure to change it? Or will it become, you know, the, the three units, how will that change? No, I think Glencore is very well diversified. And they need to be able to satisfy <clears throat> even in a period like today when we're having the shortages of power and rising energy costs, Glencore plays an important role at providing the fuel that keeps energy affordable. <clears throat> this is necessary. We cannot just say no to these things today. At some point, of course, in the future, we will be able to do that as technology advances and we have all these innovations but you can't do it until it's ready. You can't just shut off the lights and turn off the heat uh, until society is prepared for this. Society today is not prepared to do away with fossil fuels.
I'm sure in 10 or 20 or 30 years, society will be prepared. Not sooner than 10 years? You don't think we'll no, reach peak, not 10 oil, years. Uh, peak oil before then? No. Well, you may have peak, <clears throat> peak usage. demand and then but, going down. Uh, yeah. In terms of peak fossil fuels, I think fossil fuels will be with us for the next few decades until the transition is able to happen. Um, what, what do you do with China? So I know we had this stop and start from you know the various lockdowns and covid does that change your view of international equities now don't forget china besides the start and stop of covid we've also had the regulatory burdens placed on the tech sector so i think the better news coming out of china is from the tech sector perspective they seem we seem to have hit peak regulation <laughs> okay we'll talk about peak everything david harrow <clears throat> chief investment officer for international equities at harris associates stays with us now coming up we also talk the republican party liz cheney loses in a landslide the trump opponent loses her primary race so maybe we'll focus on u.s politics as well this is bloomberg Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now let's focus on U.S. politics. Liz Cheney this week lost in a landslide in a Republican state primary to a candidate backed by former President Donald Trump. Cheney is a House representative for Wyoming and the highest profile Republican to reject Trump's false claim that the 2020 election was stolen from him. Now let's continue our conversation with David Harrow, who also has a, a deep and inside knowledge also of the Republican Party, but also U.S. politics. C can you run and win if you go against Trump? Well, I think you probably can, but you have to be the right candidate. And I think, you know, Donald Trump has a number of issues. And they're all basically personality-based. I mean, if you look at the policies of the Trump administration, the four years they were in, they were somewhat successful. Unfortunately, Donald Trump has become his own worst enemy. As a result of, I don't know, severe narcissism or whatever it is, he just can't behave as president, which unfortunately shields some of the policies which they've done. I mean, don't forget, it was Donald Trump who told Angela Merkel, you can't rely on uh, Germany for, or, uh, for Russia for your gas. I mean, no, but, but if you, if you <clears throat> leave the, then the policies, I mean, he's still like, like the Republicans are still sticking with him. Some Republicans are sticking with him, some are not. I mean, this is. This is an issue, and I think it's probably best for the country. In the United States, this country of 330, 400, 340 million people, let's kind of move on. Let's start with a clean slate. Let's find leaders who are respectful and yet understand how free market capitalism works and how it elevates people. All right, David, you have to come back. I have like a million other questions to ask you. <laughs> David Harrow, their Chief Investment Officer for International Equities at Harris Associates. More Bloomberg surveillance next. This is Bloomberg. I do have confidence the Fed will eventually do what's necessary. We have uh, an important Fed meeting in September where we think the Fed's going to hike another 50 basis points. I think if they're going to make a mistake, it's going to be on uh, tightening a little bit too much. The last thing the Fed will want to do is over eagerly slow this pace of tightening. Powell needs to play on his talk a very hawkish game. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong, our top stories today. Mixed signals from the Fed. Policymakers differ on whether to go big or go small with the next rate hike. Misery in the U.K. Consumer confidence falls to the lowest in 48 years, and London's subway system grinds to a halt over workers' strike with jobs and pensions in the balance. And showdown in Indonesia. China's Xi Jinping and Russia's Vladimir Putin will attend the G20 summit in ba Bali. That could set up a confrontation with President Biden and other leaders opposed to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. 
Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lyons in New York. Anna Edwards is off today. And Kaylee, happy Friday, but not a lot of risk appetite out there this morning. Yeah, not such a happy Friday for risk assets, Danny. It was a down day broadly in Asia overnight, down on the week, and that actually snaps a four week winning streak. The MSCI Asia Pacific Index was lower by about half of 1% or so, with China underperforming down about seven tenths of 1%. Of course, in addition to concerns around the Chinese growth story. There is also concern around geopolitical tension with Taiwan as well as with the U.S. and China, U.S. and Russia with the G20 heads that we'll have more on in just a moment. The real story for me though today isn't necessarily that equities are down. It is that the dollar is up in a big way, a stronger dollar against basically everything in Asia overnight. The Japanese yen uh, down against the dollar, the big underperformer down about half of 1%. We're trading right around 136.50 and the South Korean won a big story as well. It of course very sensitive to that Chinese growth story down about four tenths of 1% against the dollar map. But really, it is the broad dollar strength this morning that is catching my eye. Yeah, absolutely. And I've got the uh, Bloomberg dollar index here on my screen. So we can see right now we're at 1282. We're just about one and a half percent away from the highs that we saw in July. So investors will be watching that closely. Investors are selling um, treasuries right now that pushes the 10 year yield up to two spot. 9225, um, but they're not using that money to buy uh, futures. You can see S&P futures are down uh, almost eight tenths of 1%, and NASDAQ futures are down more than 1%. So we could see some real drops in today's session. Um, finally, Bitcoin right now down at more than 7%. So 21,777. Just a few days ago, we were talking about pushing up to 25,000. We've come off a long way from there, but we know Bitcoin is very closely correlated with risk assets. And with Fed speakers out, out all over the place saying, no, you've got this wrong. We're going to continue to raise rates. We're focused on inflation at the expense of derailing the economy. That has uh, risk assets really selling off. Danny, what do you see in Europe? Matt, it, it certainly feels like a day where we're selling everything except for the dollar. And Europe is no exception. We're seeing risk assets, specifically stocks, really take a hit this morning. It's really those high beta cyclical type industries and sectors that are faring the worst. The DAX, for example, that's almost down 1%. It is a textbook risk off. And that's the only sectors in the stock market that are in the green this morning are healthcare and utilities. It is only those safety sectors, everything else getting pummeled this morning. Yes, it is the summer. Yes, volumes are low, but it is this concern over global growth in Europe. I want to point out the UK specifically because it is a fascinating, if not worrying story that's been developing. We had retail sales this morning that were stronger than expected. I won't get too much into it. We're going to have Lizzie Burton in just a moment to talk about that. But that gives us this idea that the BOE can go at it harder, perhaps do another jumbo rate hike. So we are seeing UK two year, year yields up seven basis points at their highest since 2008. That would use usually translate to a stronger pound, but it's not. This morning, it continues to be about king dollar without risk aversion. So we are looking at cable down three tenths of 1%, not just under 120, it's under 119 at 118.90. And finally, we're looking at this global bond market sell We're looking at German 10 year yields. Those are up uh, eight basis points. We did have really strong PPI, but again, we see break evens move higher. Kaylee, inf inflation expectations continue to push higher given that energy is just so expensive in the region. All right, so sell stocks, sell bonds by the dollar seems to be the theme of the day. As for what else today will bring, some more earnings are coming here in the U.S. Deere's third quarter results are due before the market open. How are they working through inflationary cost pressures as well as ongoing supply chain issues? Then London's subway network will largely grind to a halt as workers go on strike. Danny Berger after the show will be figuring out how to get home <laughs> from work. And we'll get more Fed speak today. Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin will be speaking to the Maryland Association of County Summer Conference in Ocean City, Maryland. What does he have to say about that 75 basis point September move that Jim Bullard wants, Matt? Yeah, Jim Bullard, and we've heard a lot of Fed officials uh, coming out, both voting and non-voting, saying that the market has got this wrong and they're going to continue to hike. They're offering mixed signals about the size of the next rate hike, as uh, you implied there, Jim Bullard urging another 75 basis point move. Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari says the Fed has more work to do to bring inflation down. The question right now is, can we bring inflation down without triggering a recession? And my answer to that question is, I don't know. Uh, we know we have more work to do in raising rates to bring inflation down. 
Kansas City Fed President Esther George struck a more cautious tone and said the central bank had already done a lot on raising rates. Bloomberg economy reporter Michelle Jamrisco joins us now for more. So, Michelle, uh, what was the most striking thing that you heard from the four officials that spoke yesterday? Well, Matt, another day, another divergence of Fed views presented. Uh, you know, of course, Thursday we had all four, uh, George, Bullard, Daly, and Kashkari. I think the thing that really struck me most was what Esther George had to say. Um, she was echoing a point in the minutes that came out about watching carefully for that lagged policy. So, you know, this is something that the Fed reiterated. They said, you know, monetary policy works on a long and variable lag. Uh, we didn't know it, you know, from the minutes, but it is clear now that Esther George is one who holds that view. Uh, we have to remember she is a voter, so this matters, uh, but she's also one that was once an uber hawk for a long time. And now she's, you know, in this topsy-turvy world this year, she is hawk turned dove, and she's carrying that message. So uh, on the other side, you had, of course, as you say, the Fed consensus uh, talking about that inflation fight being far from over, the Kashkari uh, dove turned hawk. On the other side, uh, you know, reiterating that position, uh, Bullard saying, let's go big in September. Uh, he's probably pushing for that 75 hike that the investors see for a third straight month and then you see or for third, third straight meeting and then you see Mary Daly somewhere in between open to that 50 point hike or a 75 point hike and, and watching uh, that data. But she's not a voter, right? She's not a voter. So Daly and Kashkari are not voters. Bullard and, and Esther George are the ones to watch in this uh, confab that we had yesterday. Well, there's certainly a lot more to watch, Michelle, next week, given that we have the sort of Jackson Hole, of course, a great Bloomberg special. We'll be covering that. What sort of signals sure. will we be watching for further Fed strategy? Well, it's a lot of big explosive data reports that I'm sure markets in the Fed will uh, disagree on from here to the next meeting. But uh, we'll have, before the end of the month, we'll have the Fed's preferred inflation gauge, that's PCE. And then early next month, uh, the first half of September, we'll have the big jobs report, of course, and then another CPI reading uh, to come off that 8.5% that got everyone so excited. So, you know, I have Mary Daly ring in my ears from the BTV interview recently where she said, the Fed is data dependent, we're not data point dependent, uh, but nonetheless, we'll have a long and rocky road ahead, I think, uh, just digesting all this data. All right, Michelle, thanks so much for joining us. Michelle Jamrisco there talking to us about the Fed picture this morning. Now, UK consumer confidence fell to a record low today as concerns about a recession increased and soaring inflation tightened the squeeze on household finances. Meanwhile, retail sales unexpectedly rose in Great Britain. Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden joins us now for more uh, on the island's economy. So, Lizzie, what does the data mean for the Bank of England? Well, Matt, we did have an upside surprise in retail sales. Credit where credit's due. Our UK economist Dan Hansen saw it coming. There was this boost from online sales, but I would point you to the difference between retail volumes and retail sales. What it shows is that people are spending more but getting less, and that comes back to inflation. As you know, we're back in, we're already at double digit inflation here in the UK. There's also, as you mentioned, this GFK Consumer Confidence Survey. It shows that the outlook is that it's it's worst uh, on record, again because of inflation. The reading's at minus 44, minus 30 for context is the level synonymous with recession. So it very much leaves 50 basis points on the table for the BOE in September. Well, very much so a factor of this. Of course, there are rail strikes throughout the UK. Uh, those workers asking for more pay. You have us finding it difficult to find any way to get home today with the tube strikes. How does all this end? Well, thank God I've got my bike, Danny. Good. <laughs> Uh, but there could be some sympathy with the workers because you've got this double-digit inflation. Remember, in the jobs data, you saw real regular pay falling the most on record. But despite that, the unions don't seem to be able to be winning a deal with the government. The Transport Secretary Grant Shapps uh, has said that it's time for meaningful talks. It's time for the unions to put a deal on the table. But what I would point out is that the disruption, as you could feel, exaggerates the economic cost. It's actually a drop in the ocean compared to the overall economy. And let's face it, there's never been an easier time to work from home, even if not for me and you. True. Yeah, Lizzie, you might have to give Danny a ride home on your handlebars later today. <laughs> Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden, thank there you There are taxis, so people. There are taxis in London that and Ubers. Money. We were just talking about the cost yeah, of living crisis, Matt. In this economy, Matt, come on. <laughs> All right, let's move on to geopolitics. China's President Please. Xi Jinping and Russia's Vladimir Putin are planning to attend a group of 20 summit later this year in Indonesia. That's according to Indonesia's President Joko Widodo, who spoke in an interview with Bloomberg editor-in-chief John Micklethwaite. 
I know that you have invited President Xi Jinping to come to the G20. Has he, has he said he will come here in November? Yeah. Xi Jinping yeah. will come. And President Putin. President Putin has also told me he will come. Their presence would set up a showdown with President Biden and other leaders opposed to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Jack Fitzpatrick, Bloomberg government reporter, joins us now with more from D.C. Jack, if Putin shows up, will Biden go? Uh, the plan as of now is for Biden to go, but it would be a, a very uncomfortable situation. And this development is a, a failure from the U.S.'s perspective. They had pushed for uh, not only Putin to not be invited uh, to the November meeting, but for Russia to be uh, kicked out of the G20. Uh, and and there, this would create quite a showdown. Uh, keep in mind that Vladimir Zelensky, the Ukrainian president, uh, was also invited and was supposed to be in Bali in November. Uh, so it, it's safe to say if everybody who has said they would go actually shows up, it would be a, an uncomfortable meeting. Uh, and as of right now, it's, it's a, a disappointment from the U.S. government's perspective. In terms of the Trump affidavit decision yesterday, um, who won that? I guess we're going to see in a week um, what kind of redacted release we get. Yes. Uh, the question is how much is going to be redacted if, if there's a partial release. Uh, it's it's turning into a, clearly not a binary decision as to whether all the information uh, that led to that search warrant for Mar-a-Lago comes out. Uh, the question is what portions of it are likely to come out because the judge in this case has said uh, they're not uh, likely to withhold absolutely everything. Now DOJ raised the issue of there's very little that they want to release from that affidavit because they feel that it would uh, harm their ongoing investigations. Uh, if they try to redact essentially everything, the judge may end up making the decision. So even now, it's not clear uh, whether DOJ will come up with a plan that's satisfactory to the judge, uh, but at least some information is supposed to come out regarding the, the background of how they justified the search warrant at Mar-a-Lago. All right, Jack Fitzpatrick of Bloomberg Government, thanks so much for reporting from Washington. Now let's get some information on the stocks moving in pre-market trading here in the U.S. I have to begin, of course, with Bed Bath & Beyond. Ryan Cohen, the founder of Chewy, who once was one of the very reasons that meme traders were buying this stock, is now the reason there is very intense selling pressure this morning. He has exited his entire stake in the company, him re reaping a reward of nearly $70 million as he did so. But that is weighing heavily on the stock after a 20 percent decline yesterday. The stock is down another 40 percent in pre-market this morning, though we have to keep in mind through Wednesday it was up about 400 percent in a three week period. So very, very wild. Now, speaking of other speculative areas of the markets, of course, we're seeing Bitcoin down hard today back below 22,000. Matt was mentioning that earlier. And as a result, a lot of crypto stocks are down as well. One being Coinbase, the big exchange down about 7.3 percent. A more positive story out there is applied materials. It makes the machinery that makes semiconductor it actually gave a more bullish forecast than expected. So that stock is up about four tenths of 1%. Not a massive move given it was an upside surprise on the guidance, Danny, but it just goes to show you how risk sentiment overall is pretty downbeat today. Yeah, sad times when uh, one of the best performing pre-markets isn't even up 1%. We are looking at U.S. futures down on the lows of the morning. Now, the one thing to do well this morning, it is dollar. We're going to have that conversation coming up. We're going to be speaking to Mara Chandon, FX strategist at J.P. Morgan. And more from Jokowi's interview with our editor-in-chief, John Micklethwaite. Indonesia's president weighed in on everything from nickel duties to electric vehicles. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lines here in New York. Danny Berger with us out of London as Anna Edwards 
is off this week. Now, we are simulcast on both radio and Bloomberg television, but for those of you listening on radio, I've got a chart here that I'm just gonna walk you through. It's pretty simple, actually. It's the Bloomberg dollar index, and what we see is a continued rise up to a high in July that we bounced off of and came back down, but we're now rising back towards it, and only one and a half percent away. The strong dollar uh, makes central bank's decisions outside of the U.S. very difficult and also weighs on economies outside of the U.S. And Danny, the Bank of England is one of those central banks that's having to play catch up with the Fed and continue to hike rates. Also, it's fighting its own massive inflation problem. I, I think it's just so telling, Matt, just the dominance of the dollar that despite a BOE, which is contending with double digit inflations, which is already front loaded rate hikes and wants to keep going with jumbo rate hikes, sterling is so weak. We're looking mm -hmm. at a cable rate that's down four tenths of one percent this morning. Kaylee, it's trading at 118, a good time if you want to visit London, by the way. <laughs> but it just shows that the dollar is so dominant that despite hikes in Europe and the UK, none of those currencies can get a bid. Yeah, it's kind of a chicken and an egg question, right, Danny? Because is the dollar so strong just because all of these other currencies are so incredibly mm. weak? like the pound, like the euro, or is it just dollar strength? And I also wonder to what extent it is still about the rate differential story in a hawkish Federal Reserve, and to what extent it is just a bid for safe haven because of all the geopolitical risks out there, the growth concerns out there. I would note it's not just weakness we're seeing in the European currencies, but in Asia as well. The South Korean won down to a 13-year low against the dollar overnight, Matt. It's really quite remarkable. It is really quite remor remarkable. Um, you know, the, the consistent threat around all Western economies, though, is the inflation. And that's one I know, um, Danny, that you're contending with in London. Mm. We talk about the tube strikes. Um, when we talk about the Bank of England, I always think of Andy Bailey and other central bankers saying that workers shouldn't ask for raises. <laughs> yeah. um, and I can't understand why they want um, the decrease in inflation to come from that side, the, the wage mm. side, rather than the price side. I, I think they should rather say to companies, don't raise prices, um, but pay your yeah. workers a little bit more. Because if I were a tube worker looking at 10.1% inflation, I would sure as heck want to raise as well. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit of a disconnection, right? This this idea that people wouldn't ask for wage rises when they have to just pay up from everything, from electricity to food as well. And of course, we're looking at nat gas in Europe and power prices at another record. So certainly more discontent to come. Well, for more market analysis, MLiveGo is where you want to head on your terminal for all things markets. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kidley Lines with Matt Miller in New York and Danny Berger in London. Anna Edwards is off today. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. China has reported the worst week of COVID infections since mid-May. They've been fueled by outbreaks in vacation hotspots that risk spreading across the country. There were more than 18,000 new infections in the week that ended Thursday. European intelligence officials say Russia is probably using a nuclear power plant in southern Ukraine to shield troops and equipment. That's a tactic that undermines the security of the plant. The nuclear facility is Europe's largest. The U.S., U.K. and E.U. have demanded access to the plant for international inspectors. The world's largest producer of nickel used in electric vehicle batteries may impose a tax on exports this year. That's according to Indonesia's President Joko Widodo, who spoke with Bloomberg News Editor-in-Chief John Micklethwaite. Indonesia is home to almost a quarter of the world's nickel reserves. And even if your company isn't planning layoffs, the one next door is. That's according to a study by consulting firm PwC. It polled more than 700 U.S. executives and board members and found that half said they are reducing headcount or plan to. 52% have implemented hiring freezes. And Matt, you were the one who pointed that story out to us yesterday. Pretty gloomy. Yeah, it is gloomy. I mean, we did have very strong employment data at the last non-farm non payrolls report, but that is obviously backwards looking data. I spoke with the CEO of ZipRecruiter a couple days ago, and he was very adamant on focusing on the amount of open jobs. But I think that number is going to start to dwindle as more than half of the companies mm. um, polled by PwC expect to reduce 
uh, jobs or at least freeze hiring. Yeah, and of course, to some extent, softness in the labor market is what the Fed would like to see. But at what point does it become problematic and what does that mean for their hiking path, which of course will influence the dollar? We'll speak with Mira Chand, an FX strategist at JP Morgan, about that next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Mixed signals from the Fed. Policymakers differ on whether to go big or go small with the next rate hike. Misery in the UK. Consumer confidence falls to the lowest in 48 years. And London's subway system grinds to a halt after workers strike over jobs and pensions. And showdown in Indonesia. China's Xi Jinping and Russia's Vladimir Putin will attend the G20 summit in Bali. That could set up a confrontation with President Biden and other leaders opposed to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I'm Danny Berger in London alongside Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York. Anna Edwards is off today. And Matt, it, it feels like perhaps the market has finally woken up to Fed speakers who are batting down this concept of a Fed pivot. Yeah, I wouldn't be so sure about that. Nonetheless, we do see futures down this morning. The market does seem to me very determined um, that the Fed doesn't know what it's talking about. Right now we <laughs> see S&P futures down about seven tenths of one percent. That is the Fed speak coming through that we saw last night. Jim Bullard saying no, 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 we really do want to go 75 at the next meeting. Um, and the 10 year yield is getting sold off. So we see that rate rising back towards three percent right now at 292.62. A little bit of uh, conflicting market moves there, but that's nothing new. We've seen that pretty Pretty much every day. And I want to point out also that we've seen a lot of turnarounds, right? Yesterday, we started out the trading session um, deep in the red and then finished up the day in the green. So there's been a lot of volatility in these markets, even if we haven't seen a lot of drops at the close. The Bloomberg dollar index right now is gaining uh, 341 to 1283. So it's a gain of more than a quarter percent. And we're almost back to the July highs. This is a big market focus. Kaylee said earlier that she's looking at that coming through in Asian currencies. We can obviously see it coming through in European currencies as well. And you can see it to some extent um, and more coming through in Bitcoin uh, down seven and a quarter percent. OK, a lot of people will debate whether or not it's a currency or an asset. Um, nonetheless, twenty one thousand seven hundred and twenty one is a lot lower than we'd seen. We were pushing up towards twenty five thousand. But we know Bitcoin is very correlated with risk assets. Kaylee, what are you seeing in terms of pre-market movers? Well, Bitcoin is also correlated to the performance of crypto related equities. So as a result of that big decline, for the cryptocurrency itself today. You're seeing some real pain out there for those kind of stocks. Marathon Digital Riot Blockchain each down more than 10% before the bell. And of course, crypto, one more speculative area of the market, the other being meme stocks that have gotten attention a lot in recent weeks. Bed Bath & Beyond was up 400% in three weeks through Wednesday. Then news hit that Ryan Cohen, a big shareholder, the founder of Chewy, had filed to sell as much as 7.8 million shares, basically his whole stake. He then did so. So the stock was down 20% yesterday. It's down another 4 41% before the bell this morning, while he obviously got a big profit from that sale. A lot of investors still holding the bag are feeling the pain uh, today. And I would note it's not just Bed Bath & Beyond in meme world that is under pressure. You're really seeing it deflate broadly across the board, including for GameStop, which is down more than 10% in early hours, Danny. Well, Kaylee, it's a whole lot of red when it comes to these European markets as well. Currencies are down, bonds are down, as are stocks. The European benchmark down about a third of 1%. We did see UK stocks just in the past few minutes flip to positive, up only about one-tenth of 1%. But that just might be some of the FX effect coming through. We're looking at sterling below 119, trading at 118.73 versus the dollar. That's a decline of half a percent. This thing is getting beaten up as the dollar reigns supreme. That's despite the fact that we have really hot UK inflation that's sending bond yields up higher. That's up six basis points for the front end of the curve in the UK. But it really just shows how much of a bind the country is in terms of their economy and where rates go from here. And also just how prevalent that dollar move is this morning. We're also looking at German 10-year yields. Those are also moving up about seven and a half basis points. So bonds settling off in Germany as well. Again, the ECB remains committed to hiking rates, but it's also just this issue with really really difficult situation when it comes to the energy story and what that means for the European economy, Matt. All right, we'll be paying very close attention to that, especially to the currencies right now, because Mira Chandon joins us, FX strategist at J.P. Morgan. Mira, let me first ask you about um, the incredible strengthening dollar. We're back 
almost to where we were in July at these really high rates. What does it mean to you? Um, and, and what does it mean to other economies? Um, so the strong dollar is actually um, a natural uh, out, outcome of the developments that we've seen in the last uh, two or three weeks or so. I think we've seen some pretty encouraging developments out of the U.S. in terms of a softer inflation print and the employment data showing that actually uh, the economy is not slowing down as much as uh, investors had feared. So slightly better uh, outcome on the U.S. side of the equation. Whereas what the main notable shift has been has been outside the U.S. We've seen European vulnerabilities grow uh, larger. We've seen uh, China vulnerabilities uh, grow as well as the data momentum has petered out sooner than expected. So I think it's important to understand that actually uh, the dollar strengthening has been very fundamentally driven. Uh, don't really think that it's going to have any implications for the Fed at the moment. Uh, they're singularly fixated uh, on uh, firm inflation and bringing that down. And uh, the strong dollar at this point, it doesn't really, uh, really help that much with that. So, it's helping a bit, but not much. So is it a safe haven play? Is it because, you know, U.S. Um, federal funds rates are higher than other central banks' benchmark rates? Um, or is it, uh, you know, a, a vote for a stronger economy in a world where um, it looks like there are a lot of recessions looming? Um, it's a safe haven play, as you said, Matt. Um, it's Frankly, you know, you don't need to, the U.S. doesn't really need to be uh, in, on an improving growth trajectory. All that needs to happen for the dollar to strengthen is uh, for the rest of the world to do poorly. And in an environment in which uh, Europe is grappling with asymmetric uh, energy dependence issues and China growth momentum is petering out, that's an environment in which, uh, which is ripe, actually, for dollar strength. Well, and then on the other side of this, I mean, Mira, I've just been fascinated by what Sterling has been doing. I mean, down half a percent this morning. It's below 119. Is there any reason to buy this thing right now? <laughs> the short answer is no, there isn't. Um, <laughs> I think if you look at the euro block within the developed world, uh, Sterling is by far the stagflation uh, poster child. You've got double digit inflation. It's flirting with, uh, it's uh, expected to be in a pretty, uh, you know, deep uh, negative uh, growth. Uh, recession towards uh, the end of the year uh, and high gas prices and energy prices, uh, even though the imported um, exposure to Russia is not that large for the UK, the high energy prices is certainly a big hit to growth. So certainly we still think that sterling is a sell here. What do you make of this debate then unfolding as to what the BOE does? Danny Blanchflower telling Bloomberg Radio this week that they should be thinking about cutting. We've heard from other former BOE officials saying, hey, maybe double interest rates at this point. Where do you stand? Um, I think they have to raise rates. Inflation is uh, clearly running out of control, and that is the priority uh, for uh, the central bank and, and should be. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, for the last two decades in the developed world, uh, we have been uh, coaxed into thinking that uh, rate hikes are always good for the currency. Uh, well, the last two decades hadn't really seen double-digit inflation the way we're seeing it today. And uh, for the central bank to be raising rates, uh, going into a recession because of high inflation is actually a recipe for currency weakness. So we do think uh, that uh, the currency weakness uh, for sterling and euro, for that matter, uh, is here to stay. So on the cable rate, parity, realistic, Mira? I think the parity is, uh, is, uh, is a bit of a stretch, but I think 115 is certainly within the realm. All right, well, euro dollar clearly just holding just above parity at the moment. That's in the developed world. As we talk about persistent dollar strength, Mira, what does that mean for EMFX? Sure. So if we go back three weeks, I think the one encouraging signal had been uh, that China was on a rebound. The growth momentum there was improving. Uh, data had been beating expectations, and there was a hope uh, that if you looked at the global landscape, that's where you would get uh, the potential green shoots from, if you will. Uh, but what we've seen in the past week is actually uh, that uh, the credit creation numbers uh, and uh, the retail sales, asset, fixed asset investments have all disappointed across the board in China. Uh, so I think that doesn't help the situation, and actually uh, it is an environment that uh, suggests uh, for the weakness in EMFX. We're looking for dollar CNY, for example, uh, to head to 695. Uh, and we're under an uh, underweight EMFX overall uh, versus the dollar as a result of that. Is there a possibility for real stimulus, Mira, in China? I mean, we keep seeing relatively small from an American perspective numbers, and they are the second biggest economy in the world. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I think the surprise uh, rate cut uh, this week from China was uh, has stoked some um, has stoked some optimism in that regard. Uh, but uh, you know, this is something that uh, will be a multi-month process uh, to unfold. And what we are actually uh, more concerned about uh, is the fiscal cliff that's uh, that's likely to unfold over Q4. So that is something that we are following pretty closely. Uh, but I think uh, the bar to get there is uh, is uh, pretty high in the very near term. So we do think. Uh, that the near-term market uh, direction is actually going to be for more EM FX weakness rather than um, rather than strength on hopes mm. of such Mira, a stimulus. Going to have to end things there. Great to get your thoughts this morning. Thanks for joining us, Mira Chandan, FX strategist at J.P. Morgan. Coming up, Indonesia's President Joko Widodo confirms that both Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin are attending the G20 summit that's taking place in Bali this November. More on Joko Wee's interview with our editor-in-chief, John Micklethwaite, next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the principal room. Coming up later today, an interview with the CEO of Lamborghini. That's at 11.45 a.m. New York time, 4.45 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Matt Miller in New York and Danny Berger in London. Anna Edwards is off today. As Indonesia prepares for the G20 summit in Bali this no November, President Joko Widodo has confirmed that both Xi Jinping and Russia's Vladimir Putin are planning to attend. That's despite calls to cancel Russia's invitation over the war in Ukraine. Jokowi, as he's known, spoke to Bloomberg's editor-in-chief, John Micklethwaite, in West Java. Rivalitas antara negara-negara besar memang... The rivalry of the big countries is indeed worrying. What we want is for this region to be stable, peaceful, so that we can build economic growth. And I think not only Indonesia, Asian countries also want the same thing. But this, this visit did not help stability. What we really want is stability. What we want is peace in the region. There is a concern that if there is a conflict in Taiwan, it would spill over into the South China Sea, where you have territory, territory that China contests, and there are territorial um, claims there. Is, the, is Indonesia ready to defend itself or defend its land and waters in that case? Are you ready for that conflict militarily if it happens? We do want the region to be peaceful. It shouldn't come to the point that tensions rise until it affects economic growth and then later on affects the well-being of our people. In my opinion, it is very important that there is a space for dialogue between leaders, especially leaders of big countries. The global situation is extremely difficult and there shouldn't be further unnecessary issues. We are going through a food crisis and an energy crisis that hasn't been resolved. The pandemic still exists in some countries. I know that you have invited President Xi Jinping to come to the G20. Has he, has he said he will come here in November? Yeah. Xi Jinping yeah. will come. And President Putin? President Putin has also told me he will come. American investment in Indonesia over the past five years is $9 billion. China has invested $40 billion. You know, you look around here, we have a Chinese car factory around the corner. China's, China is buying up a lot of the refineries that make precious metals. Part of the population is Chinese. America at the moment is losing the battle for hearts and minds in Indonesia, but also in Southeast Asia. Do you, do you think that is fair? Indonesia wants to be friends with everyone, with any country. We don't have problems with any country. Each country will have their own approach. Each leader has their own style and approach to bring in investment. So there shouldn't be a problem.
yang lebih kita butuhkan investasi. But now, what's needed by Indonesia is investment technology. That will change our society. Widodo also explained that he wants to ensure Indonesia isn't regulated uh, or relegated, I should say, to being only a raw material supplier or component maker in the global electric vehicle supply chain. What we want is the electric cars, not the battery. For Tesla, we want to build electric cars in Indonesia, from Ford electric cars, Hyundai electric cars, from Japan, Toyota, Suzuki. And we want a huge ecosystem of electric cars. You've made a very eloquent case, and Elon Musk is a famously reasonable man. Um, why, why has he said no to the car factory then? Is it because of the environmental side? Masih, masih dalam proses pembicaraan. It's still in discussion. Let's see later the final result. <laughs> you, have, you have negotiated with Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin. Um, are either of them as difficult to deal with as Elon Musk? <laughs> Everything needs time. I don't want to be quick with no result. It needs an intense communication and the result will show. That was Indonesian President Joko Widodo speaking with Bloomberg's John Micklethwaite. Danny, it's been said that sarcasm is the lowest form of wit, but I still find it amusing, especially when coming from John. Uh, jokes aside, um, jokes aside, the um, the news that Putin and Xi are mm -hmm. planning on physically attending the G20 summit, I think, is absolutely fascinating. And, and you have to wonder how Biden is going to deal with um, being at a summit with Vladimir Putin. Yeah, well, first, Matt, let me say I think Shakespeare was wrong when he said brevity is the soul of wit. Obviously, it's sarcasm. But yeah. yes, I do think this is really interesting. It will probably lead to some pretty big tensions. But more than that, I mean, it is just yet another reason to buy the dollar. Dollar got a little bit of a boost after that headline, just adding to the many reasons, as we were just talking with Mira about. Well, up ahead, we'll get you set up for this Friday. More surveillance to come. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in New York with Danny Berger in London. Kaylee Lyons has left our set to go over to the set of Bloomberg Surveillance Original and join uh, John Farrow and Tom Keen. Tom is with us right now to give us a preview of the program. Tom, uh, what have you got uh, planned? What, what's your single best chart to kick it off? Well, the single best chart is what's going on today. This is not a summer Friday. There's some real markets on the move here, all seen through the litmus paper of the foreign exchange market. It started to break yesterday afternoon. It continues forward through Asia, through London, and now into America. And I went to the emerging market known as the United Kingdom. Uh, Matt, you've got Brexit over with the red circle. That was where John Farrow did a seven-hour workday, really extended out <laughs> that day of Brexit. Down we go with sterling weakness. And a new bout now as we break through 120, ever weaker sterling. Sterling is 22%. Below the last time Manchester United, they beat Aston Villa, I believe, in 2013. It's been a massive depreciation. I noticed you guys were very big on the Man U story yesterday. Um, <clears throat> to me, Elon Musk's tweet was clearly a joke from the onset. And then they're now only considering selling a minority stake, right? I mean, minority stakes yeah, must change hands every day. I'm glad you bring this up, Matt, because I'm so well versed in it. Um, <laughs> My, 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 Danny knows more about this than I do, but my answer is, is the minority interest, according to my expert, uh, John from Coventry, uh, is really not all that powerful. You're sort of just there. You spend the money. What control do you have? And exactly. it'll be interesting to see who shows up. There's a guy in the United Kingdom with more money than the three of us combined and somebody else, I think Apollo bidding. I, I you know, I, you know, the tots, they offered me a minority interest in the tots. I turned it down. <laughs> Tom, I was about to say I'm surprised you're interested in a story that doesn't involve uh, Harry Kane here. But anyway, 
Back to Sterling. I got to say, I'm really looking forward to your conversation with Jane Foley over at Robo Bay. Yeah, this is timely. I, I really want to emphasize this is not a sleepy Friday, Danny. Yeah, certainly not. Is Harry Kane, is that the guy from One Direction that everyone talks about? Yes, oh, it is. Oh, my. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tottenham, come on. Oh. Come on, Matt. Okay, I don't really know that much about soccer. Football Tom, captain of England. Tom, looking forward to your program. Jane Foley uh, joining you as well. Seth Carpenter and a number of others. We will all be sure to tune in. Later on in the day, I want to point out that we have a really important interview the CEO of Lamborghini joins us from Pebble Beach. Right now is the uh, Concours d'Elegance, and it's probably the most important car show in the world every year out in, uh, um, out in California there. I want to say Monterey. I'm not exactly sure where it is. Paul Sweeney, I think, has a place there. In any case, I'm looking forward to asking Stephen Winkleman about the possibility of a continued V12 engine. Are they going to go all electric? We saw Dodge, which is, of course, a very different car maker, yesterday present uh, an electric version of its Challenger muscle car, or rather the Charger, but only with two doors. So there's a lot to talk about in cars as we make this switch um, to EVs. And importantly, uh, we're going to get an extension of the tax credit. So I can get $7,500 off over the next 10 years if Lamborghini makes an all-electric car in America with batteries that use U.S. sourced minerals. Danny. I'm, I'm so personal to go back to the 80s with the Countach. Not that I was alive then, but if I had a Lambo, I think that's what it would be, right? They made it. They just made a new one that is gorgeous. So I oh, agree. There we go. Yeah. Well, let me let me just put out a public service announcement. If you have said Countach, feel free to pick me up and take me home today because there are UK strikes along the rail system. That's what I'm going to be watching for the rest of the day. But look, I mean, it's kind of boring, Matt, for me to complain about how I'm going to get home because, of course, the much more important story are those who work on UK rail. Yes. It is perhaps unsurprising that they want to raise given inflation just came in 10.1%. Matt, to keep wages the same and have to pay out the nose for energy costs, for energy bills, I mean, that just does not seem tenable. No. Uh, it, it'll be interesting to see what comes of this. Of course, UK rail workers, I feel like they go on strike every couple of weeks. Is that fair? Uh, let's, let's say every couple months. Uh, so I just remember living there uh, and there were tube strikes constantly. In any case, um, it'll be interesting to see how that turns out and how you get home. So, so anyone with a Countach in London can pick you up. <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait for it. All right, that's it for us at Early Edition. More surveillance is up ahead. This is Bloomberg.